Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Friday, August 30th. Derek Van Riper, you know, Saris here with you ahead of the long weekend in the States. And we are crawling to the end of the week. I think we're both just dragging through these last couple of hours of work for the week. Not because we don't like our jobs, because this week has been very busy. Got kids going back to school. We got all sorts of things going on. Just general life stuff. It's the way it works, right? So we'll try to help you through it. Try to get you ready for the waiver wire this weekend with our weekend waiver wire preview we got some news and notes to get to and some project prospect along with a few mailbag questions and uh, you know we'll get our discord fired up too so if you're out on the boat this weekend or in the backyard or working or wherever you got to be you can be on the discord getting help with your teams chatting with some good folks about baseball and we've got a new channel for show recommendations like tv shows and movies too so check out the oh, greens channel I need that. Yeah, I think we all need each other for that to get those those fresh recommendations. We had a really good uh, reaction to our discussion about the top two, uh, the, how good uh, Soto and Judge are. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I tweeted about it, but uh, there was a thing from the Discord uh, that the Yankees are 2-10 and 10 when neither Soto or Judge get a hit. 15-18 and 18 if they have one hit combined, um, but 49-13 and 13 if they both have a hit. Uh, 21 and two when they when they have four hits, and they're averaging 2.5 runs per game when those two are are hitless, and 5.1 in all games. So, um, I, you know, there were some responses that tweet being like, "Duh, like you know, these are great players, and if they play great players, don't hit." I'm like, I don't know, dude. Like, you know, I'm I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm sure that the Arizona Diamondbacks aren't you know uh, under 500 when you know Cattell Marte and Jock Peterson don't get a hit. Right. Because there's a little bit more there to pick up the slack. I think you'd see a distribution sort of similar to the one you described when the two best players in the lineup, you know, don't get a hit, get one, all that with all that breakdown that would exist. I just don't think it'd be as extreme yeah. as we're seeing. Some other teams might have a combination like that. A lot of teams don't have a combination that good. That's the whole point. But yeah, that was that's how it got. That's how we came up. <laughs> it's like, yeah, all right. Just look at the Diamondbacks. They're de- definitely different. Somehow scoring the most runs in the big leagues. Still surprised. Josh Peterson, their best hitter. <laughs> get on in there, though. It's a good time. Let's get to some news. This was a really bad, weird play in the Royals-Astros game on Thursday night. So Lucas Ersig tries to field a comebacker with his bare hand, pitching hand. Kind of bobbles it. Has to rush the throw. That's one of those things where you're like, your body like does it without, it's like instinct. Yep. And then, like, I've done this throwing to the kids in the cage where, like, they they hit one right over my ear. And I'm like, oh, God, why did I put my hand out? <laughs> yeah, so he rushes the throw to first base, throws a little offline, turns Vinny Pasquantino's glove hand into the path of the runner coming through first base. Vinny Pasquantino. Uh, didn't Rizzo get hurt like that? But a lot of guys that got yeah. hurt like that. I mean, I've seen I've seen a bunch of different injuries at first base. The actually the worst one I've seen it was a non uh, professional injury. Of course, it was a, a softball game where a shortstop rushed to throw, threw it into the first baseman's shins, and instead of getting hit in the shins, he lifted his leg, like like bent at the knee, lifted his leg up, the foot that was planted by first base, but the guy running through first ran through his leg. It. Oh. it was real bad. That was a fracture. That was the worst one I've seen. Hmm, Fortunately, big leaguers have the instincts not to do that. Our soft softball injury was, uh, I was having a dis, I, I, we were like kind of trying to set up our team and, um, you know, uh, it was mixed men and women. Uh, and there was a discussion if I should play third base or, uh, first base. And this girl was like, I played D one softball. And I was like, yeah, you can play third base. You could stand over there and take it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you I mean, you know what you're you know what you're doing. I I'll just be an idiot out there, you know? Uh and she Yeah, got one in the mouth. Did you get short hopped? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, that sucked. Yeah, that's not fun. And it was like, you know, like twenty minutes after we'd had a discussion of like, who should play third. <laughs> I mean, she'd wanted to, so <laughs> and she was she was gonna be better than me, but <laughs> yeah, it would have got you too. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Wrong place, wrong time in that instance. But yeah, yeah, and this that's the case with these guys. I mean, I, I, you know, it's just it's it's going to happen sometimes on the on the on the field. It sucks. Vinny's out now. He's been great, and he's out now six to eight weeks. They announced, which uh, even if it's on the short end, you'd be lucky to come back for any playoffs. Um, 
so that that just sucks for the Royals and the Royals look every day like they're you know gonna get that wild card spot but now one of their best hitters I, I you know we haven't heard anything about Ursaig so I won't I, my instinct is that he'll be out a couple of days and he'll be all right but yeah, yeah, we'll see if we get an update on him, but day-to-day is the assumption for now. And Vinny Pasquatino is starting to hit even more lately. He was the ninth best hitter of the last 30 days in the Fangraphs player Raider. So we kind of talked about it, I think, mid-season, where the further away he got from that shoulder injury, the more likely it was that he was going to start to hit like the guy he was pre-injury. I think that was actually happening. Uh, so trying to replace him, you know, it's probably a mixed bag of, I don't know, like Nick Prado and just kind of, finding finding a way on the bench to kind of scrape together a viable option at first base. I don't know if there's a straight one-for-one one replacement that's going to gather up all that playing time. <laughs> Can I tell you something I noticed about the the uh, the Royals recently? Mm. A- a- an old friend of ours? Yeah. Have you noticed? Um, I MJ Melendez. Oh, he's been going half. crazy. 264, 312, 529 slugging with an 18% strikeout rate. I love it. That's great, though. I mean, like, especially in a non Vinny Pasquantino Royals lineup, you're going to need MJ Melendez or some of the other guys in that mix who haven't played at a high level to play better. That's just part of how you replace a player like that. Isn't it weird that he's just going to end up about the same place as he did last year, where he's going to have, you know, you know, 18, 19 homers, 230 average, and be like, you know, 5% worse than league average uh, with the stick. And like, maybe he's just, we, it's been so many ups and downs that you're like, he's terrible. He's great. He's terrible. He's, he, he's not a major leaguer. And the, the sum of it's going to be like, he's the kind of guy who puts up a half a win a year. I mean, I think in the end, this is not someone to bet on long term, I guess. Even though it's been good in the second half, I think you're right. And even though projections across the board have him above a 100 WRC plus the rest of the way, it's strange. It continues to be strange. And I'll need help explaining it forever. Like, I just, <laughs> why isn't he better? I just don't know. He's, and when I watch this year, yeah, he's chasing. I mean, he's, it's a, it seems like a terrible approach. And so I don't, I don't, when I watch, I just see the same thing every time where it's just like he swings at everything. And I guess sometimes he hits the ball hard. <laughs> I guess he he makes contact. So, you know, that's not a bad strikeout rate. It's not terrible. I don't know. It's um it's perplexing to me. I can't I can't put him on any more lists. He's not on any more sleeper lists. He's off. <laughs> Four time uh, sleeper breakout <laughs> exactly. candidate. Yeah, Jim exactly. Lendez. <laughs> The, the player four times you're off. <laughs> the player that probably plays a little bit more, I guess, in all of this. I mean, you would assume a lot of Sal Perez maybe playing first base and Freddie Fermin catching more. But like I said, they'll shift a couple guys around and you know, mix and match to offset that lost playing time for Vinny, Vinny Pasquantino. Bunch of Dodgers injury news to follow up on, including some vague details about Tyler Glasnow's injury. He's scheduled to throw on Friday to resume throwing and there is optimism from Dave Roberts that D- Tyler Glass now will return this season but that's not exactly what you want to hear with a month to go in the season if you were hoping to get even two or three starts from Tyler Glass now before the season is over I know you just went through the challenging exercise of re-racking pitcher rankings for the final month and everything kind of comes down to schedule and availability at this point like just trying to order names like you could take a guy with top five skills and have to bury him outside the top 30 or top 40 if there's a lot of uncertainty about the number of starts he's going to make or if the few starts he is going to make happen to be against really difficult opponents. Yeah, I tried to make a little mini tier at around 50. Um, I just thought that after 50, you get into guys where it's really spe- schedule dependent. Um, you know, you're Charlie Morton, uh, at Philadelphia. Do you really want to pitch him there? Um, and, uh, you know, same with like, I know Sean Manaya has been good, but at Philadelphia at Atlanta makes me scared. Brandon fought against the Dodgers. Those are guys who are in like the fifties, you know, that I, you know, I, and the guys who are in the forties, I, I want to start almost all the time. I don't really want to start Seth Lugo at New York. 
Um, but uh, there's, you know, the guys above 50, I would want to start them in most of their starts. And the guys, uh, you know, the guys who are ranked better than 50, I want to start them in most of their starts. The guys who are ranked above 50 and, and higher, um, I want to I want to start in every other starter. So so that's why I thought, okay, this is a good place to put you, Darvish, Tyler Glass now, and Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Yamamoto's on a rehab assignment, so we've got a schedule, and he's had a two start, uh, a two inning start, so he could have a three and a four or a three, and then be out for. He could have his four in the major leagues, you know, because he's kind of ramping back up. Um, his velo wasn't quite there, so you have uh, some performance risk on top of it. With Glass now, I don't think you have as much performance risk, but. The starts that they have for him on fan graphs are at Atlanta versus Colorado at Colorado. This is assuming he comes back for three starts. So that's uh, an okay. I mean, at Atlanta, you would normally start glass now versus Colorado. You'd be very happy to at Colorado, especially if it's like one of the last games of the season, they might just put him out there for two innings and be like, okay, your tune up is done, but you know, stay healthy for the playoffs. So with you Darvish, He's throwing. He's talking about coming back. He's on the schedule. The schedule is the Giants at home at the Giants, Houston, L.A. You'd want to start him for, like, I think three of those at least, maybe all four. Um, but it's a schedule. It's not like he's in the rotation yet. You know what I mean? So all three of those I thought were uh, difficult uh, ranks, and so I just kind of threw them together around 50. Yeah, totally makes sense. Just given the circumstances with one month to go in the season, be sure to check those rankings out. If you don't have a subscription, the athletic.com slash rates and barrels will get you the best available deal on a sub covers everything. Baseball coverage on the stretch fantasy football. You might have a draft coming up this weekend, early next week, everything you want for one low price. The Dodgers are pretty banged up. Freddie Freeman is dealing with a hairline fracture in his finger. He's missed some time this week. They expect him to return on Friday, but that's the sort of injury where even if he's playing, I'm not quite sure he's your typical Freddie Freeman for the final month and plus also, of the season. Every game that the Dodgers put between them and the Diamondbacks and Padres is a another game of buffer that could lead to him not playing as much. <laughs> you know yeah. What I mean? <laughs> The problem, though, is that leads only four over the Diamondbacks and five over the Padres entering play on it's Friday. It's close enough now that you want Freddie to play, I think. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to go into a five-game skid and all of a sudden, you know, the the uh, the, the division's up for grabs. And, and, and as much as people talk about, you know, um, we've had some high-profile um, – you know, teams that have gone on, like gone on buys and, and uh, gone and, you know, and not done well in the second round recently and how people might not prefer the buy. I would have to say that you get a free series with a buy, <laughs> you know, like you could have lost in that first round. Yes, you could have. I think people completely <laughs> overlooked that. And I also think, you know, it's relatively new having these types of buys. So yeah. I don't know if we can look at the first few years and have some really great teams. Yeah, the playoff schedule has changed every year. You know, yeah, it's like give it time before we're sure that this is actually a really bad thing. We know layoffs as far as hitters and timing after what four or five days that can start to be a problem. It kind of comes to a new question of. What should teams be doing to avoid losing that? What can you do to possibly simulate the experience of hitting Live in a game? batting you practice one against one. your fifth starter, or like you know, more project yeah. stuff, or like you know, like hire, oh, call up one of your prospects, you know, uh, that still has a little bit, a few innings in his arm, and, and have him like throw a live, like you know, f try to do full bore, you know, game game type situation, you know. Yeah. Hope that uh, you know he doesn't break one of your <laughs> your hitter's arms or something. But like you know, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, you know I did want to focus on the schedule because you know these things become important when you're talking about Freddie Freeman. You know, with Bobby Miller uh, on that team, um, you know I think he's 
he's still still not 100 percent in terms of his injury it was really hard to figure out what his schedule will be because yamamoto's coming back glass now's coming back does miller go down you know and then you're watching bueller and you're like bueller doesn't look 100 percent. so like and then you know that the dodgers go to like six-man rotations you know a lot so you know they you, you're just like you put the dodgers pitchers schedules in and you're just like i have no idea another one team that's like that is the reds so the reds called up Rhett Lauder, uh, who's exciting. Um, uh, but they also uh, have Charlie Liebrandt, who is, uh, no, they have Brandon Liebrandt, who is the <laughs> son of Charlie Liebrandt. Uh, and if you know what the timing is, you know that that means that the son is 30 years old already, and he's a minor league journeyman. Um, and the Reds are basically, they have Andrew Abbott hurt. They have... Um, uh, uh, Hunter Green hurt and Nick Lodolo went down with a finger injury. So they are just scrambling. Um, we get louder. Uh, I have his, uh, his stuff plus profile uh, from AAA. As you can see, he has average ride. That's what that, uh, da- that dotted line means. The gray line is average. He has average ride, but he has plus velo uh, at least, uh, you know, above, uh, above average reload. So he sits around 95 with the fastball. Uh, his sinker is better than his four seam. So he's kind of a sinker slider guy with a good changeup. And so the big question will be, is that four seam fastball good enough uh, to get lefties out, you know, to, to uh, keep lefties off the changeup basically, you know, cause he's going to be more sinker slider against righties, more four seam change against lefties. So that's, that's going to be uh, the question mark for Red Louder. But, and, and then on top of that, it's a really tough stadium. So, um, you know, when you're, and then on, on top of that, when you're trying to, you know, put his schedule together, you're like, I don't know. I don't know what his schedule is. I don't know what the rest of the rotation looks like. Is Nick Martinez a full starter or is he a three, three inning guy that's piggybacking with another guy, you know? So um, that was the hard part of this whole enterprise. And then, you know, another thing was like, you know, just, I wanted to mention Bowden Francis, you know, pitched really well yesterday and that's, he's, he's got a really nice stretch going. And I think we've talked about how the splitter has been a big deal for him and he has good shape on his four seam, the, the breaking balls a bit slow. So somehow the splitter really pulls it all together, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, I ranked him 66, um, which feels low suddenly. And the reason why I kind of ranked him 66, well, did I 67th is, um, he his next two starts were boss at Boston at Philly. Mm. Now he goes out and has such a good start at Boston that I'm not a, a, as scared about you know playing against Philly. And then after that he's met, uh, Mets, Rangers, Rays, and Marlins. So he has all of a sudden one of the best schedules since he got past this Boston thing. So he's going to make my ranking look bad. But um, you know I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his. Um, Zebby Matthews, who I have right next to him, is like the exact opposite. So I had Matthews ahead of him. I think they're very similar, is that they both have pretty good stuff, wideish enough arsenals, really good command. Um, Matthews goes Blue Jays, Rays, Angels, and then he finishes Guardians, Red Sox, Orioles. And so, you know, I had Matthews ahead one because I was like, well, in an ideal world, you could have Matthews for the next three starts and then switch to Bowden. But you know, you might not have that luxury. Yeah. yeah. Now, now people are asking me about Francis or Jared Jones. I'm like, uh, I'm sorry. I'm still Jared Jones. <laughs> I know he Life comes a- at you fast. Wow. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I still, you know, I know Garrett, Jared Jones didn't have a great start coming back, but it's, it's still easily Jared Jones for me. Life really is like holding hands and then looking back at the, <laughs> Yeah. The person that looks an awful lot like the person you're holding hands with, but holding having hands with Jared friend. Jones and looking at Bowden Francis, like well, I don't know, yeah. Bowden Francis is like 30 or something, and like it's 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 not the same thing. Jared Jones is like a top prospect who throws 99, so I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes you can just just say fastball goes burr. Yeah, but if you're wondering why rankings are difficult, why every decision you make for your fantasy team this time of year is difficult, it's for all of those reasons. It's because the plans are written in pencil. It's because the injuries are piling up and you have these these new players being added to the mix that could be running up against season innings caps. Like we 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 don't even know like where each team is setting workload guardrails for some of their guys and 
Louder is not the only prospect debuting. This weekend's uh, Project Prospect will focus on a few of these other names, too. And Louder's coming up as part of a doubleheader that the Reds have with the Brewers on Friday. But they they pulled him up. They didn't make him the 27th man. They didn't make him the 27th man. So it's not an automatic go back down. But if you can show, you can go back down. Yeah. So that's kind of weird. It's funny. D.L. Hall is the 27th man for the Brewers in that doubleheader. So he will go back down, even though Velo looked a little bit better at AAA in his recent outing. So maybe there's still something brewing with D.L. Hall. But the Angels, of course, are bringing Right after my rankings two, come out. <laughs> two, two more starting pitchers coming up. One. Gary has like a five ERA in AA. Yeah, Samuel L. DeGarry is going to come up. And he's barely pitched at double A. I think he's made six total starts at that level, a couple in the Phillies organization and the rest in the Angels organization. After that trade, he's part of the Carlos Estevez deal. Mm. El Gary will debut Friday against the Mariners. Soft landing spot if you're in a league with first come, first serve pickups. Like If you're just desperate for anyone starting, sure, you could try it. This feels more like a rush job to me than Caden Dana, who's been great at double A all season. Even though he's younger, he's got a lot more experience at the level. 23 starts this year, 135 and two thirds innings, over a strikeout per inning, you know, a 259 ERA, a 0.95. We've been whip. hearing his name for a while. Like he's this is yeah. this is like a slow bubble and like 135 innings of a 2.5 ERA. You pay attention to that. Uh, I like the strikeout rate. I don't. I can't comment on this stuff necessarily, but the fifty fastball and the seventy slider grade from Fangraphs is a is a decent uh, foundation at least. Yeah. So Dana will go Sunday, and I, I'd be more interested in streaming Dana in the same kind of first come first serve league. Dana of course. Gary, yeah, yeah, pretty healthy gap between them. But the thing that's tempering my enthusiasm about Caden Dana is last year he threw sixty eight in the third innings, and if he's at 135 and two thirds right now. I don't know what the Angels' limit is for him, but if he gets into the 150, 160 range, there'd be no restrictions next year. So we could be nearing the point where they're planning on shutting him down anyway and giving him a, a taste of the big leagues for a handful of starts I, might just be the way to cap off the season. I could see that. Yeah. I could see it being two start, like get him to 150 so that next year he can do whatever he wants, basically, innings wise. And then that's it. Yeah. So that's, that's like more the, innings. <laughs> that's the problem, I think, you know, looming here if you're interested in this group. So I think out of like Louder, Aldegary, and Dana, even though Dana on paper might be the most interesting, Louder might be kind of the sweet spot of team needs him. He is pretty close to big league ready. I remember reading a scouting report from Eric Longenhagen earlier this summer suggesting that Louder could have been the best starter in the Reds rotation upon arrival which mm. was before the step forward from Hunter Green this year. And Nick Lodolo's looked really good when healthy. But it just gives you an idea that this isn't just a, a quality back-end arm that moved quickly out of Wake Forest. Louder could be an impact starter for a team that might end up with three of them in short order if he does, in fact, stay up. Yeah, yeah. I think... Um... You know, I had him in a little mini tier with Jack Leiter, who I thought might stay up, uh, but once option back down. And Joe Boyle was last in the mini tier. And this is another mini tier that is designed uh, to make me look bad because Joe Boyle is now a reliever. Yeah, I saw the, <laughs> the Boyle start on Saturday. I think it was Saturday. He pitched against the Brewers. I was watching that start with my dad. And I said, okay, watch. He's like, my dad's never seen Joe Boyle before. I'm like, look, electric stuff, no idea where it's going. Like, that's going to be everything you see. Sat 100 day. for you guys, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. He, he did all the Joe Boyle things. Like, yeah. every, every box Joe Boyle can tick, he ticked them all. It was, it made me look very smart. <laughs> yeah and lighter looked good uh he's looking really good stuff wise i mean everything's there stuff wise but it's the same package as boyle uh which is why i had them near each other um his location plus did not improve much right now his location plus on 149 fastballs which is a decent sample is 95.5 and that is barely doable hmm. the thing that's interesting about lighter we talked about this last week when uh, Ryan Bloomfield joined me. It's just that the the results of AAA have taken off in mm-hmm. recent weeks. Like if you go back and look at his last 
five outings there. It's a 36 to nine strikeout to walk ratio in 23 innings. Uh, the reason I think he got sent back down is because the Rangers and White Sox played a doubleheader and he was designated as the 27th man. But mm-hmm. they've got enough injuries in that Texas rotation where I wouldn't look at the fact that he was the automatic demotion and say he's not getting more of a look. I think they want to see what he brings to the table and try to get a read on yeah. where he's at at this point with his stuff to see if he can be in their rotation to begin 2025. You know, one thing that Ryan Pepio told me that I think is relevant for um, Jack Leiter is that when he first came up, uh, he struggled with the walk rate, but he did well enough. And that was important was he did well enough to have the confidence to say, hey, my stuff actually plays in the zone. And there is that interplay of command and confidence where it's like, hey, you know, Jack Leiter, you know, Going four against the White Sox, getting out two with four strikeouts and two walks, that might just be good enough for him to say, hey, you know what? Like when I threw it in the zone and didn't walk the lineup, it worked well, Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm actually, you know, next time I get up there, I'm just going to throw all my crap and, you know, kind of towards middle, middle and let the, you know, the movement, take it away from middle, middle and, and just simplify things. So, um, Jack Ladder still has a chance. I don't know. Joe Boyle's chances are running out. Yeah, Boyle increasingly looks like a reliever that still needs to improve his command to even be the best possible version of himself in that role. But you could see high leverage stuff when you watch him, even when he's all over the place. That's always been the case mm-hmm. with Boyle. Now, it's interesting that you know with lighter pitching better, we also have Kumar Rocker healthy again at AAA. And because they were teammates in college, very high profile guys at Vandy. Bonkers K minus BB for, for Rocker right now. Just absurd. It seems like they're always just kind of linked together. It looks great coming off Tommy John, though. A 39 to 3 strikeout to walk ratio in 24 and two thirds innings. That includes his first start at AAA. Five innings, one hit, 10 Ks at Round Rock on Wednesday. So things are beginning to really kind of turn around for both of these guys, especially now that Rocker is healthy again. I'm curious if you had to make a decision today, if you only have one in a keeper dynasty league, and they're available in some places, depending on the I'm number. I'm taking of Kumar keepers. Rocker. You're taking Kumar Rocker. What's the I, big difference? I just think the the command is is better, you know, and uh, like I'm looking at his minor, if you're looking on YouTube right now, you're looking at his minor league, uh, Kumar Rocker's minor league location numbers. They're all above 100 except for the change up. Um, and I know that some people have described his slider as a sweeper, but I was looking at his raw movement numbers on the slider and it doesn't look like a sweeper to me, which is important because if it's a bullet slider and it's got a 124 stuff plus, then it's a really good hard bullet slider that he can work against lefties and righties. Um, and then he's just going to be slightly better against righties because he can do more sinker slider action on them. Um, he has the same thing as Rhett Louder, where his uh, IVB, his vertical movement is not great, but his velo is even better than Louder's. He sits 98. Um, so it's a velo driven thing with his four seam, but he's going to just have to hope that his four seam is just good enough, um, you know, that lefties don't kind of. Uh, lean over the plate, you know, because against righties, he's going to be able to sink or slide under to death. And um, so it, it's a similar uh, package to Rhett, to Rhett Louder's. It's just um, he's got more extension than Rhett Louder, and he's got more velo than Rhett Louder. Rhett Louder actually cuts the ball off and doesn't have great extension. So neither of these guys is what, uh, despite their numbers and despite some of the hyperbole and some of the, you know, some of the s- stuff we've heard, neither one of these guys would be like a Jackson Job to me. You know, okay. they're they're like really exciting young guys that could make it, but I'm not, you know, I'm not like this is the next DeGrom. Like when I watch Jackson Job, I'm just like, this is pretty amazing. So we've had this uh, underlying question we've been trying to answer for the last couple of weeks, breaking it up into parts. Players that we're looking at watching closely, either for a late season debut or guys that could emerge to have a lot of value early in 2025, right? So we did, I think, infielders a few weeks ago. We'll get some outfielders probably next week. Since we're talking about lighter and rocker and they kind of fit into this conversation, and now we're seeing some weekend debuts for those Angel starters and for Rhett Louder. You know, who else are we trying to watch closely in the upper levels of the minors down the stretch, trying to see if we get a sneak peek at someone that could make a pretty big impact? I think the Pirates have a couple of starters in Bubba Chandler and Braxton Ashcraft that could be knocking on the door. If not for a call-up at the end of the season, 
at least for an opportunity to compete for rotation spots going into 2025. Yeah, Bubba Chandler has a 139 stuff plus on a 97 mile an hour four seam with plus vertical ride. Oof. <laughs> That's pretty sick. If you want, like, I, I, I know I'm not looking at uh, movement numbers right now, but if you want someone who looks like Jared Jones, it's in the numbers, in the stuff in location numbers, it's Bubba Chandler. So uh, that's really exciting. And I think in, in some ways, I almost like him better than the other two because he has a great four seamer. I mean, I, I, I know that this league is kind of doing other things and there's more people kind of, you know, doing sinker stuff. And, you know, I want people to have multiple fastballs and all that. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm just going to bet on the guy who has a better four seam because especially if they're a righty, because they have to do something against lefties. Now, Braxton Ashcraft, on the other hand, has a 92 stuff plus on the four seam. He has some good breaking balls, but this is more of a um, breaking ball first approach. And, and obviously, there are many pitchers in the big leagues where their breaking balls are better than their four seam, their, their fastballs. But I just, I'm a little bit more inclined to reach for the guy with the good fastball. I just think it's easier to see them put together things and become an ace. You know, you could be Seth Lugo. If you have a bunch of, if you have a great feel for spin, you can be Sonny Gray if you have a great feel for spin. I don't think you become Garrett Cole without a great fastball. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can be one of these guys pretty good, you know? But like, if you're looking for a Garrett Cole, that's Jackson Job. That's Bubba Chandler's closer. You know, that's, that's, that's why you look at these guys, Taj Bradley, you know, um, Jared Jones. You look at guys with great four singers. Yeah. I think. It gives you a lot of margin for error when you have yeah. a great four seamer because the other stuff can be a little slow to follow, but you've got something you can throw often that's at least good enough to get mitigate the line of twice. Is, yeah, you have to get through opposite hands. You know, you have to have a fastball you can throw to opposite hands. What are you going to do against lefties if your best pitch is a sinker? Your yeah. best for the hard pitch is a sinker. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense as far as just like the basic foundational thing you're looking for. If you can only choose one, that would be it. So is there anybody else that's going to jumping off the page to you that hasn't debuted yet pitching well in the upper levels of the minors? I mean, I think the White Sox even have a couple guys. Jairo Iriarte is kind of interesting. He's had a good year so far. Uh, I think he's worked entirely at double A sub four ERA, almost a strikeout per inning. Still like to see either some improvements in terms of the walk rate or a slightly higher K rate from him, but opportunity is going to be, like wide open for the White Sox during this rebuild. So the threshold for getting a chance there is a little bit lower than it is in a lot of these other situations right now. Yeah. I mean, they, they also like, I think it's one of those things where you kind of need to show your work a little bit. Like you have to have some success, you know, when you're on the White Sox and be like, Oh, but we at least uh, determined that this guy is part of our future. Um, so, you know, I think that's actually a little bit of what's happening in, in uh, Anaheim, mm -hmm. you know, gets the extension. We go on the, on the pod saying like, oh, he's already, he's still on the hot seat. I don't know. He got an extension. He's still on the hot seat. He can. And, but I also said to be fair to him uh, and to Perry and to the angels that if they all of a sudden prove that they have some like hot young pitching prospects that you know could pitch next year in the major leagues in the rotation that they could turn things around fairly quickly uh, so you know that's what they're trying to do there i think you know the white Sox, anybody could come up uh and, and be pretty exciting quickly so i agree with you on that one i think one of the other more exciting names i've been waiting on in auto new for the whole season i thought maybe there was a chance we'd see a 2024 debut but now it looks much more like 2025 is tink hints in the cardinals organization an injury cost them some time uh, from like late June until late July. But Hens has really good stuff. The K rates jumped up this year too at double A. He's always been young for the level. So it, given that the injury didn't cost them that much time, I think there's a really good chance he could be in this rotation early in 2025. And it might bring some much needed swing and miss, right? We've talked for a long time about the Cardinals lacking pitching prospects that can miss bats or being unable to find guys that are high quality starters within that organization. I think, they might be on the verge of graduating one with hence. Yeah. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm scouting the scat line, stat line here, the scat line. Wow. Um, a little <laughs> bit. And uh, 
Oh, that's interesting. Ryan Webb, uh, you know, pops when you look in the, in the Guardians. You know, I was like, oh, there's a guy with great K minus BB in the minor leagues for the Guardians. Um, you know, could need you could need some starting pitches. I, I go over to Stuff Plus because he's been in AAA and he has a 66 Stuff Plus on the four seam with a 90 mile an hour average velocity. So um, I don't know that I I'd like to retract that name. <laughs> it's okay, you can have that one back. <laughs> uh, let's see here. If uh, Gunnar Hoagland, I, I'm just looking at strikeout minus walk rates in AA uh, with teams that could uh, could use uh, the, the the pitcher, um, and uh, Gunnar Hoagland has a 57 stuff plus on his four seams. So. This is why I think, you know, it's a little bit hard for me when I'm looking at double A guys to be to get excited because I think there's all sorts of different ways to get to a good K minus BB. For example, you could have a small BB. Yes, you, know? you could. And uh, when you do that in the minor leagues, I think that sometimes that can be filling up the zone against inferior hitters. Uh, then you get into the major leagues and you fill up the zone against superior hitters and uh, you get 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 knocked away knocked around so um i don't necessarily see uh, a a top of the k minus bb list guy that really pops except for Caden dana who is 20 years old among a bunch of 25 year olds um you know one of the problems also is uh you know how many innings uh these guys all have 100 innings which means they're almost like kind of journeymen you know Mm mm-hmm how about Brandon Sprout? He's had a pretty interesting season. Started at high A, spent most of the summer at double A, had a 33.2% K rate, 6.5% walk rate, tons of swinging strikes. Gets the bump to triple A, has only thrown 17 in the third innings there over four starts, but has just had a miserable time with everything. Not striking guys out, has a home run per nine above three, has grotesque ratios, an 883 ERA and a 162 whip. There's a lot here to work with. So I I think I'm really hesitant right now to look at what's happening to pitchers at AAA and and draw much of a meaningful conclusion about it. Even somebody in the the waiver preview, Ty Madden, had pretty good numbers up through AA, got to AAA, and the ratios have just been awful. I don't think it's necessarily the function of the stuff not working. I think it just might be the weirdness of AAA with ABS right now. Well, you know, particularly at the top of the zone, and what you hear, what you have here is a guy who has a 92 stuff plus in the four seam. What if he was uh, really happy living at the top of the zone in double A, and then he gets to triple A, and those are now balls, right? Right. Uh, that means that maybe he has to come down a little bit further into the zone, and if he doesn't have a plus plus four seam, right now it's getting knocked around. Um, on top of that, you don't know what the you know organizational. Uh, philosophy is for you know what pitches should he be throwing right now um you if he was being showcased for a trade uh he would throw his slider a lot more right now he's throwing his slider 12 percent of the time with a 129 stuff plus easily his best pitch um you know if he was being showcased for a trade bump that up to 40 percent be a two-pitch guy and, and trade him out of there but right now it looks like the philosophy is Try to develop all your pitches. Throw your slider 12% of the time. Throw your cutter 18% of the time. Throw your change up 12% of the time. Curve 7% of the time. So he's throwing all his pitches, though his slider is clearly his best pitch. We may see him as a major league reliever that's sort of 50-50 fastball slider. That way, you get that stuff loss on the four seam up by getting more velo in it. You know, this is that's something that I could see in his future. But the other part of that the that the you know, Mets are betting on is one of those secondary pitches jumps a little bit, gets a little bit better. Somehow he mixes them a little bit better. He reacts, he figures out how to pitch to the zone, uh, and he becomes more of a back end starter. I don't know if he's a front end starter either way. The other name, just number scouting that uh, caught my eye is Quinn Matthews, looking a little more into what he has done this year. He's picked up a little extra velocity. He's a lefty also in the Cardinals system. So nice to see maybe two starting pitchers possibly making enough progress to join that St. Louis rotation. At nice at strikeout point. rates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's geez, 33.8% at double A. Real nice with a good walk rate. Doesn't seem to have a, a major home run problem, at least to this point either. So. Another name to sort of file away, probably for draft and hold season at the very least, because they're going to be looking for some answers 
in that St. Louis oh, rotation. And you know he has innings. That's why I remember Quinn Matthews' name. Everybody remembers Quinn Matthews' name, no? Oh, yeah, Stan, right, yes. The heavy, heavy workloads, yeah. 40 pitches or something, you yep. know, and... Yeah, and so he 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 has come as advertised with innings. He already has 73, 75, 125 innings this year. So he's going to get to 130 innings. You definitely want him, I think, in draft and hold next year. He will be he will give like if he has 150 innings and he's at in him next year, 160 innings in the next year and he's at double A, you know, you know, I feel like you you can pencil at 70 of those in the major leagues at least, even if he's not and even if they're not talking about him for a rotation spot, he'll be the seventh, eighth guy. You know, he'll come up and pitch. Yeah, I think that's that's a good way to frame it. And there's room for him to be a bigger part of the plan if he's able to earn that in spring training. We've got a few mailbag questions to get to here. One not on the screen. The first, first one was um, from Stunads. 525. I never know where to put the emphasis on a Discord handle. <laughs> is it Stun Ads 525? Is it Stun Ads? Stun Ads is what I'm guessing. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd never want to, I'd never want to guess. Yeah. <laughs> because this person could have an amazing advertising business called Stun Ads. And yeah, that that's right. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to damage that. But the question was the other day on the pod, you mentioned that one MLB team doesn't have its own stuff plus model internally as a lifelong Cardinals fan and longtime listener of the pod. I have to ask, are we that team? No, it's the Rockies. Somebody, uh, somebody reached out to somebody I was talking to and asked them to build them a, a stuff model. And they were like, why don't you just do that internally? Like you don't have any analysts. Yeah, and that was like, build a special one in Colorado. Or you could just watch the Nick Juan presentation. Yeah, you should actually. I think it's actually super important for them to build a stuff model, you know. And they should actually probably build two stuff models: one that is altitude adjusted and one that isn't, because they would learn a lot from like, oh, you know, these types of pitches actually, you know, do perform better. And like, you know, if there's any team that should have like a huge analytics department that they listen to and invest in, it should be the Rockies. I have, I think since the first time we've ever talked about the Rockies, like in 2019, year one of the pod, we said, well, what's it going to take to win in Colorado? And that was, I think still the Jeff British area. We've been adamant on this show that they should have more tech, more data, more information, more everything, more gadgets than any organization. More weird approaches. They should have, they should have debuted the opener. They should have debuted bullpen games. They should, they should have been on the front end of a lot of those things. Yeah. hundred percent agree. So thank you for that question. Stun ads. Oh, oh, oh they, and, and, and as to the Cardinals, w the evidence, I don't actually have direct evidence that they have one, but my evidence that they should have one is that Mozilla came out and said, we need to concentrate more on swing and miss stuff. And he, you know, using the word stuff now is like a little bit loaded, you know, <laughs> like I got Craig Breslow to talk for 15 minutes of winter meetings about stuff plus basically, you know, and use that in the, in the Red Sox article that I use. So like, you know, I think now stuff is almost an encoded sort of, yes, we have a stuff plus model. That's sort of how I read it. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, you know, got stuff plus on the brain, but that's, I mean, that, what is he saying? He's like, we need more swing and this stuff. We need to study this. We need to, we need to promote it. We need to create it. Like, how do you do that? Uh, you know, I think stuff plus is obviously something I use for evaluation, but I think it's actually most powerful in development. Cause if you say, I want you to have a better curveball," and the pitcher says, fine, I want to have a better curveball. Then the next question is, what is a better curveball? Yeah. And stuff <laughs> plus is the answer. <laughs> you know, can, like when you when I just showed those uh, here on YouTube, when we were showing those interactions between velocity and, and, and ride that create the stuff plus for four seamers, like you can redo those interactions and you can be like, here's horizontal versus vertical. Oh, wow. If you made your four seam more horizontal, which we've been chasing vertical all this time, what if you made you a two plane four seam? That would actually work too. And maybe that's more attainable for you. So that's the work of a pitching coach. And it's aided by Stuff Plus in ways that um, I guess are not happening in Colorado. Sure seems like it could help, but you know, just my opinion from a thousand miles away. Our next question comes in from Ponchoed, which I assume is an ode to Ponchos. 
Ernie Clement may be an interesting late breakout pro profile. Heavy pulled fly ball approach has out producing his raw power. He's only striking out at a 9% clip. Seems like he's going to make a ton of contact on balls that have a good chance to find their way out of the ballpark. And the average will hold up with the low K percentage, regardless of his Babbitt profile. So what do you make of Ernie Clement, an unusual sub 10% K rate guy who's actually getting some pretty good run right now for the Jays as part of the sort of lost second half. I don't know. There's one part of Ernie Clement's profile that just leaves me entirely cold. And you know which part it is. It's got to be the chase. No, it's the entire. I, you, should, you should see my dashboard. It's the entire right hand of my dashboard. It's chase, maxi V, barrel, and hard hit. Yeah, it's low, but it's a low, very, the extreme low K percentage profiles usually come with decent amount of optimal they can power. and, and suboptimal bad ball stats right that's generally how it goes if you yeah. get that low of a k rate then that's what you're giving up and he's got 10 homers and 352 plate appearances he's finding a way to hit the ball bit, in the ballpark yeah it's probably a little bit more viable in the in the, with the shift restrictions and you know i guess we should have seen some of this coming because the blue jays kept running him out there and kept playing him over you know, other other names and other other younger, you know, we thought more prospecty names. Um I do like sub ten percent K rates. That's that's fun. Okay. Uh, the best I can do for you is draft and hold uh backup infielder. Yeah, I think he's the utility guy. I think he's uh after round forty five sort of pick if he's still there. I really don't think you want that's to the best, build that's teams the best around I can him. do. Yeah, that's the best. Does I enough can things do. well to play. Like that's that's the way I would look at it. And that's still that's a good outcome. Like good. I for wouldn't him be I wouldn't be sad to have him on like as one of my final keepers in my twenty team keeper league because he would be like the backup at like five positions. Yeah. Or three positions. Thanks a lot for that question, Poncho. You got to look, though, at a sub 10% K rate when it comes in over 350 plate appearances the way it has for Ernie Clement. You know, it could work in, in 15 teamers like NFBC style where, you know, you want to have one guy on your bench at the beginning of the season that could cover you hmm. in a lot of different places. And maybe he just ends up on your on your bench all season long where he just covers you for that Friday. Like, oh, there's a surprise injury. Like, it is – those guys are useful in those leagues too where you just, like, have a lot of eligibilities on your bench, you know. But, you know, I want to make sure – I'm saying all these eligibility things. What are his eligibilities? He's going to not have second base. He should He's have third and have, short, though. Third and short is good because that's third, short, and CI and MI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. Might be just good enough to hang around on that Blue Jays roster. We'll have to see. But yeah, I would not not do anything oh, yeah. as far as an early, early pick on him at all. Like it's a roster in flux too. What if they sign guys and you know he's no longer even really having that heavy of a role on their on their team next year? He's 28. It's not like they're circling him and making him part of the core. Right. And I don't think he's kind of like part of the Horowitz Addison Barger. They, uh, Rovis Martinez, like they care more about those prospect. guys, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All of those guys are bigger priorities to their long term future. Let's take a look at the other uh, other names that are interesting for the weekend waiver preview. A lot of places we could start. I mean, the Tigers pitching getting turned around. I saw Brant Herter has a two step this week that might intrigue some people at San Diego, at Oakland. Those are not layup matchups, especially Oakland. The A's have actually been a good enough lineup to beat up on some kind of average or below average pitching at the very least lately. But Herter's been chewing up some innings pretty effectively for the Tigers. I think we're at the point in the year where anybody with a two-step at least gets a look if you need innings. So what do you make of Herter and the success he's had in some limited opportunities with the Tigers? Where are the locations uh, of those places? Of those? They're both away. Hmm. I'd prefer him if he was home. Um, he's Okay. I mean, he's got a good slider, uh, below average below, below average stuff, decent command. The command is backed up by really good walk rates um, in the minors. One thing that you will notice in the minors are high BABIPs. And yes, that is often um, due to minor league defenses, minor league parks, all sorts of things. It's not something I would normally look at, especially for a pitcher. But when I see a low stuff number and a high BABIP in the minors, that's you know, one thing that we found with Stuff Plus in the projections was that it moved the needle on uh, home runs per nine and BABIP um, in the projections a lot. 
you know, so uh, he's not a guy that I would consider very likely to. He has a 222 Babbitt right now. Uh, I might project him for like a 320 Babbitt going forward. If you do that, uh, you get a, a mid four ZRA. It won't be a two step for Ty Madden, but he's going to make another start this weekend, Sunday against the Red Sox. Not necessarily one I would go pick him up and use him in for, for daily leagues. But if Madden sticks around, even though he was a guy that had brutal ratios at AAA, we just talked about Brandon Sprout a few minutes ago. I think I'm kind of intrigued by Madden as a matchups based play in September. I mean, we've seen the ability to miss bats 102 Ks and 79 innings at AAA this year, 146 Ks and 118 innings a year ago at double A Erie. It'd, it'd be more in the situation of I want strikeouts. My ratios are already just a mess and maybe I could steal seven or eight strikeouts in the right kind of matchup from someone like Madden, even though home runs have been a major problem for him, especially this year in the international league. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm sorry for those that are looking uh, at fan graphs. The, uh, the model hasn't quite loaded for last night, so we're working on that. Um, I think there's just been a little bit of an interaction between us and fan graphs that's been a little bumpy at times this year. But um, you can tell by stuff bought on fan graphs right now um, uh, that uh, his cutter is his best pitch and stuff plus agrees with that. But he doesn't throw he didn't he doesn't throw it as often as you'd expect um and he throws the slider more often so i don't know if he's being optimized but that could that could give you some hope that you know he starts throwing the cutter more um and uh starts maybe accessing some of those whiffs that have been missing in the major leagues from i mean he, to go from 15 percent whiffs in triple a to 6.9 percent in his first start um is pretty pretty a rapid decline for madden but um i, I i'm not that into either of these guys all right we'll see if madden ends up in the bullpen down the road because i think that could be a, a really nice uh, sleeper for some saves in the future if starting doesn't work out for him you shorten up that arsenal add a little velo and it all mm -hmm. could come together for him in that role look at jose tana for a moment getting a lot of opportunities with the nats basically their regular third baseman he's having a pretty good year at triple a columbus he was acquired in that lane thomas trade from the guardians has some power, has some speed, only about 15% rostered right now in the Rotowire Online Championship. Those are 12-team NFBC leagues. He's up to 60% in the main event, but I would imagine that number creeps up even more this weekend, given how much Tana is playing on this Nats team. There aren't that many red flags for me. I would say that you know his much higher swing strike rate in the minor leagues suggests that there may be uh, a little bit more swing and miss coming soon. Uh, he had a 14.4% swing strike rate, uh, Tanya did in AAA, and he has a 7.3 in the majors. That That's a little incongruous for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, otherwise, he's a guy who makes just enough hard contact, doesn't chase too much, hasn't had real bad strikeout rates in the minor leagues. I don't think, I don't think this is a Grant McRae situation. I think he's probably a true talent, like 26, 25, 26% strikeout rate. Um, he's not going to help you uh, getting on base, and that may limit his uh, long-term value to the team and his lineup placement long-term. I mean, just think about the batters that the Nationals have. He's not going to be a top three hitter for them. And projection-wise, uh, they you know they still have him being well below average. So it, it's not even super clear. Like, just think about how he was acquired, too, you know. Um, it's not super clear to me that he's part of their long-term future, but in the short term, the red flags aren't too red and he's gotten, he's got the, uh, the playing time. Um, and, uh, I'm intrigued. I think, um, I'd love to see what he does before I say anything about how I'm drafting him next year, but in the short term, uh, depending on the schedule and depending on your needs, he's a, he's a pickup. Yeah. Probably more of a 15 team league sort yeah. of pickup, but in a desperation sense for a 12, you could probably even do a little bit worse than Tana. Uh, and we've seen the Guardians make some curious trades before. I mean, like the Nolan Jones trade with the Rockies looked pretty brutal, right? I mean, that was that was the kind of thing that you but look back and they how did they come up with that? Was it Brito? This Juan Brito, I think, was the player they got Juan back. Juan Brito, uh, in 110 WRC plus as a 22-year-old in double in AAA right now. 16% strikeout rate, 179 ISO. So also um, 
maybe more positional value. Yeah, well, it could easily work out in the long run for him, but it just it seemed like they gave up on Nolan Jones pretty quickly early, for yeah. what they needed, given what he did uh, a season ago. So yeah, I'm keeping a close eye on Tana in leagues where I need some help on the corner, especially those deeper formats. I also noticed Miguel Amaya is playing really well. I kind of just split the season looking back since July 1st. Miguel Amaya is hitting 337 with a 381 OBP and a 561 slug for the last two months. Five homers, 13% K rate. He's rostered in 36% of online championship leagues. So, you know, still out there in a lot of pretty important two catcher spots. I think he's a slightly more rostered player in the main event at this point. Yeah, 77%, quite a bit higher, actually. But I'm actually a little surprised given the need for catching that people haven't been a little more aggressive with the Maya. I guess the one drawback is that despite playing a lot better, he's still stuck in that number nine spot for the Cubs most days. Yeah, a typical catcher. I mean, he's not, I don't, I don't know that he uh, exhibits many skills that would elevate him from the sort of blob of middle uh, catchers, the guys who can hit 250, but given a full season might hit you 18 homers. Like, I, I feel like that describes 15 catchers. Um, the one thing that he's doing right now that would make him intriguing going forward is sporting an 18% strikeout rate. So if Miguel Amaya keeps an 18% strikeout rate going forward. He does, he has hit the ball 111. There's still like a chance to kind of put together even more than what, what he's done full season uh, when it comes to next year. So I think he's a fairly decent uh, second catcher, cheap second catcher next year in 15 team leagues. Yeah, I feel like he's in the same class that I'd put like Joey Barton. I picked up Joey Barton a bunch of leagues in the last month or so, and I think there's a chance Bart plays a lot in Pittsburgh. I think Amaya's path to playing time with the Cubs is a little less cloudy because with the Pirates, mm-hmm. you have the long-term questions about Henry Davis plus Andy the eventual return of Andy Rodriguez. Yeah, so yeah. there's a little bit more organizational crowding in Pittsburgh. So I think that's one thing that does work well for Miguel Amaya right now. I think you were mentioning a few Marlins before we started recording that you're looking at Kyle Stowers playing a lot right now. I mean, well, Stowers, Norby, and Hill are are playing a lot. They were better pickups last week uh, when they were going into Coors uh, than they are necessarily this week. Stowers doesn't – they're just playing a lot. I, I like Norby the best. Stowers doesn't really have anything that I, that I would bring to you as like this is why you should pick him up other than he's playing – in, in deep enough leagues that matters. I mean, he he can barrel the ball, but uh, right now, 36% striker rate's not working. Derek Hill uh, is power and speed. I was happy I picked him up last week. Uh, he did some good things for me, but a 31% strikeout rate right now with a 3% walk rate is a tough, tough combo. And so I'd be pretty schedule dependent with him, um, you know, going forward. Um, uh, there was another, uh, a couple of players, uh, Addison Barger, uh, is, is playing again. Um, and it was weird because he stopped playing for a little bit and now he's playing again. Um, he's pretty much looks like, uh, he's in the lineup every day. It's just a question of where, so some third base, some outfield, uh, but the last four games in a row, uh, he's been in the fifth spot in the order and played third base. So I wonder if uh, there's a little bit of like, hey, the season doesn't matter anymore. Um, could Addison Barger just be our everyday third baseman next year? My answer to that question is maybe. Uh, you know, I think the strikeout rate will come down a little bit for Barger. I think the walk rate will come up a little bit. He's capitalizing on really good raw power right now. He needs to continue to capitalize on that raw power. He needs to continue to push that barrel rate up. If he pushes that barrel rate up to 10% by the end of the year, he's got a 10% barrel rate, 25, 26% strikeout rate, 8% walk rate. That should work as a starter. It may not be, um, you know, an amazing one that you need in your fantasy leagues, but it would be somebody that might, uh, might be interesting, might have, some eligibilities depending on your league. Uh, 22 games at third base and 22 games in the right field. So getting someone who could be CIOF third baseman, you know, again, sort of somewhere between draft and hold and bench in a 15 team league. Uh, right now, you're just picking him up because you're hoping he'll hit some dongs for you. Yeah, I think I'm thinking about 2025 a little. I'm more interested in 
taking a shot on Barger than I am on Ernie Clement from earlier, even though Clement's got that really low K rate. I mean, I think left handed, younger and power uh, trip, like third baseman. Yeah, he's, he fits like a regular profile, you know? Yes, I, I think you could at least talk yourself into that. The other thing I would say, maybe this is a trap I'm going to fall into a lot, but thinking about how difficult it's been for hitters to make adjustments to big league pitching last couple of seasons. Now we're almost 50 games in to the big league career of Barger. Like the initial adjustment phase hopefully is over. I think these next 20 games down the stretch this last month will give us a much better indication of the types of adjustments he's capable of making than his first you know, 50 or so games have told us. Like, Yes, that, that's information that matters, but I just want to see if you can adapt to what has been happening because the underlying numbers aren't bad, right? A near 40% hard hit rate. You know, K rate's not off the charts at 27.1%. There's an okay foundation here if you could start to make those adjustments. Oh, oh, and uh, he fits. I, I don't, <laughs> this is really not scientific, but we're developing a little bit of a test here for the young hitter. He fits the heat map, the two spots uh, on the heat map. He has yes. two blobs on the heat map, low and in and high and in. I'm going to count those two because uh, he's able to to hit low and high. He hasn't done a lot out uh, over the plate except for sort of middle o- middle away. Um, but high away and low away as just little corner holes for him, I think that's doable in the big leagues. You know that that's if you have a if you have a zone if you have a holes all the way across the zone high, that's a lot where the pitcher can miss but just miss miss high, right? Mm-hmm. But if it's high in a way and they kind of go for that and they do, they throw some pitch that leaks high middle and he, and he slugs it. That's a better situation. Like he has, his holes are smaller and high in a way and low in a way. Those are traditional holes across the league. If you just do a heat map of exit velocities, high in a way and low in a way is the lowest exit velocities. Makes sense. It's very intuitive, right? I mean, to drive a ball that's away is a lot harder, especially if it's down or up. Yeah. But if I he shows, it's... that's why I want to see a little bit more eye from him. Yeah. Like if it, I want to see, a li- I want to see that walk rate climb a little bit because that means they're trying to pick him away. And, and he's like, he's, he's not whiffing on those pitches away that are outside the zone. That's what I, that's kind of the adjustment I see from him. I think it's easy to tell yourself a story with Barger, given the walk rates he's shown throughout his time in the exactly. minors, that he has that ability, though. That's that's yeah. part of where that enthusiasm comes from. I think I was a little more excited about connecting the heat map than Trevor was when we put that out there. <laughs> yeah, the I think we both day. were. <laughs> we were we were willing to make the leap, and he was a little more like, nah, I don't think you could just fill those gaps in for every hitter. I don't think that's always going to be the case, but... Uh, We are going to go. We hope everybody has a great long weekend, especially if you get the extra day in the States. Uh, You can get a subscription, as I mentioned earlier, at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Check out Eno's updated ranks for the rest of the season. Do well in your fantasy football drafts if you are partaking. Be safe out there. Enjoy the time off. About football. (laughs) Yeah. You're just, you don't have to worry about it at all. Must be great. great. It's, it's, (laughs) Like there's a whole opening up in my schedule. I can, I'm like, ooh, I get to binge watch some shows and stuff. Like, there's actually going to be some time for me to do something other than baseball when everyone Light. else is doing football. <laughs> Light at the end of the tunnel. So you can find Eno <laughs> on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek and Riper. Find the pod at Rates and Barrels. Thanks to Brian Smith for producing this episode. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Tuesday. Thanks for listening. <laughs>